I'm excited to be joined today by Dr. Rachel Marsh. She is the Irving Phillips Professor of Medical Psychology in Child Psychology at Columbia University Medical Center, where she runs the Cognitive Development and Neuroimaging Lab. Rachel studies the neurodevelopment of self-regulatory control and its pathology in disorders such as OCD and eating disorders. More recently, Rachel's studying how maternal stress contributes to intergenerational transmission of regulatory deficits. Rachel, welcome to the Nature and Nurture podcast. Thank you for having me. Rachel and I met last month at the Developmental Effective Neuroscience Conference. And this conference was all about motivation fundamentally, which we have in common in our research. And I think it would be good to begin highlighting a contrast where, for mine, we're looking at pretty subtle effects in development across a very large sample in the Human Connectome Project and kind of excluding any serious uh, differences. So like if you have any sort of diagnosis or if you're on medication or something like that, these are all exclusionary criteria for the study. So we're just looking at subtle variation in typical development and don't study more extreme psychopathology like you do. And these are kind of complementary two sides to the same picture of understanding motivation. So what is it that drew you to those more extreme disorders like in OCD or eating disorders? So, I mean, I should start by saying I'm not a clinician by training. I'm an experimental psychologist. And when I was doing my PhD, I was studying um, young children trying to understand what they knew prior to developing language. And when I received the opportunity to go work with Brad Peterson at Columbia, I was fascinated because I really wanted to learn about brain imaging. Before then, I was using things like imitation as my dependent variable or um, looking times, like to see mm -hmm. where the baby looked more. Um, and, you know, I love that kind of work, but I really wanted to know what was going on in the brain. So I got to Columbia and was given data sets that were previously acquired by my mentor at Yale. And um, a lot of that data was children with Tourette syndrome. And I just became fascinated by the idea that a child can have debilitating tics, but can voluntarily suppress them. It's just, it's harder for them to do so. And it's harder for them to stay on task in school, for example, when they're trying to suppress their tics. So they're using up basically all their cognitive control capacity to suppress their tics, which makes it difficult for them to do other things. So I got fascinated by this data set. And as I was, you know, plugging my way through it and publishing some papers, um, I started thinking about how this kind of idea about really the brain being a muscle and having to exercise it, um, you know, to suppress something that is kind of innate, you feel difficult to controlling it, but you can, but it's just harder, how that could be applied to other disorders. So um, the next disorder that I started studying was bulimia nervosa because I randomly, you know, came into contact with Tim Walsh, who's um, eating disorder expert um, at Columbia. And I started studying women diagnosed with bulimia. So these are adults and noticing that the same neural systems that are implicated in Tourette syndrome are also implicated in women with Tourette, with bulimia nervosa when they're engaging in a cognitive control task. So we did task-based fMRI. I think we were using the Simon task at that time, kind of a nonverbal analog to a shrew. And we saw that they had deficient activation in these like frontal striatal, um, frontal parietal networks compared to their healthy counterparts. So I immediately was like, wow, this is so cool. I wonder when this develops. And that was at the same time that um, DSM-5 was coming out which was sort of lessening the stringency of the criteria to get a diagnosis of bulimia, which is very relevant to young girls who are just binging and purging every now and then, but still, you know, consistently. So there's a problem. So I wrote a K award application, was lucky enough to get funded on the first time, which I'm not sure yeah. happens anymore, um, to study young girls um, who are binge eating and purging like once a week. Um, for three consecutive months or three consecutive, yeah, like three consecutive months. I think that was DSM-5 criteria. Found the same thing, deficient activation of these neural systems compared to controls. And we started studying them longitudinally, showing that, um, you know, those girls who continued in, on the path of illness, 
maintain the sufficient activation during assignment tasks, during the exertion of, se- of cognitive control. Whereas the girls that tended to remit or their symptoms lessened over time, over adolescence, um, you saw less of a deficiency in their engagement of these circuits. And I just thought that was fascinating. And then it was sort of like happenstance. I think um, being at a place like Columbia Psychiatry, where there's so many talented people um, who have so many disparate sort of interests, um, I sort of I started collaborating with various people who were studying both adult and um, pediatric OCD. Blair Simpson on the adult side and Maura Rin at the time, who's now um, head of psychiatry at Duke. Um, we started studying pediatric OCD. We got funded to sort of look at the same type of neural networks, um, or really the same neural systems in both adult and um, child OCD. And at that time, you know, I was learning from all these clinicians and becoming really fascinated with the fact that like some people develop OCD during childhood, some people develop during adulthood, some people get it in childhood and then it goes away. Some people develop it in childhood and it's just like long lasting forever. So what distinguishes those trajectories? And these are sort of questions that I started asking. Um, and then really interested in, um, you know, the first line treatment for this disorder is cognitive behavioral therapy with exposures. And you really need a certain amount of cognitive control in order to be able to sit there and be exposed to exactly what causes you debilitating anxiety. Um, so then I just sort of stuck with that. And if I need to stop because I'm going on a tangent, you need to let me know. <laughs> the tangents are really good. Now, <laughs> neur- neuroimaging is sometimes controversial because people ask, okay, you know, you're mapping out the different brain areas involved, but that doesn't really allow you to change anything. It's more just like mapping a pretty picture. That's kind of a caricature of what opposition says. But Mm. in this case, I'm imagining, especially with psychiatric illness, where some people might still have a stigma about it, like it's not a real illness, just snap yourself out of it, you can be talked out of it. Does highlighting that brain regions are actually impacted by this help contribute to the idea of, no, there's a, this is actually a medical problem. And especially with Tourette's, right? Like if they're often cursing, people are even accused of faking it. And mm-hmm. I'm imagining that when the first round of brain studies came out, people started taking it much more seriously. Yeah, I agree with that. I mean, I think it does show that it is a neurobiological or a neuropsychiatric problem. It's not just faking it. Um, I think that we're very, very far from, you know, they use the term precision medicine all the time, scanning somebody and figuring out what type of medication they could use or what type of treatment would be best or what could happen with them over development. But I think that we're sort of, we're getting closer. Um, The way that I like to use neuroimaging is, you know, very consistent with what NIMH highlights right now, like trying to identify targets that could then maybe be modified for um, better treatment or for prevention. So I have one study that we're about to be starting now, and I didn't talk about this at Dan, so I'm not sure you know about it, but I work with this woman, um, Kate Fitzgerald. She's a child psychiatrist at Columbia, and together with David Pagliaccio, very uh, prolific and incredibly brilliant um, neuroimager. We are um, got this mechanism. It's called an R6133, which is really what NIMH calls target identification. And what we're doing is we're taking little kids with OCD between the ages of eight and 12 and offering them um, cognitive control training. And it's this um, app um, made by this company called Akili, and it's been FDA approved for use with um, ADHD, but it's never been extended to another psychopathology in children. And the idea is that the kids will come home from school and their parents will give them um, their iPads, which you know, is very tractable. My kids come home and the first thing they say is, can I have my iPad? And they play these very fun, kid-friendly games that kind of tap into every different type of cognitive control process. And our hypothesis is that the children who do this four weeks of Achilles training, cognitive control training, will do better at exposure therapy. Now, when I originally wrote the grant, I wanted to do what my goal is, which is to give it to kids who are just, you know, these little anxious, wiggly kids and use it for the prevention of a diagnosis of an anxiety disorder or OCD. But of course, the reviewers really wanted us to first show that it worked in a group of functionally impaired kids. So that's what we're about to start now. 
And I think it's very, very cool because if we can actually beef up the functioning of these neural systems that we know are implicated in OCD enough that these kids can actually adhere to this really difficult exposure therapy and do better, then we're moving a little bit closer to like what the point is of doing these image, these doing these scans on these kids, right? So I can imagine almost two opposite hypotheses for this. So one would be cognitive control is something that can be practiced and like a muscle as you use these brain circuits, they're going to strengthen. But then on the other hand, like you mentioned, let's say a Tourette's kid is trying to suppress their tics in class and that's taking all of their cognitive resources and then they just can't pay attention. And it, it seemed like in that example, it's not really a muscle that's strengthened. It's just draining. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, definitely. I mean, I think they're both totally plausible hypotheses. Um, I think the, the interesting thing would be to figure out a way to design an experiment to tease those, you know, different hypotheses apart, right? Mm -hmm. So then um, that's a place that I imagine neuroimaging would be more useful because you could look at, say, how functional connectivity changes over time. And maybe if a, a network is becoming stronger, that mm -hmm. shows that practice is working. Yeah, for sure. I mean, in our more recent research, I mean, I started by talking about, you know, from the beginning of when I started this stuff, but um, I think I spoke about this at Dan's, but we, we have been focusing a lot on resting state connectivity, more so than we are on task-based now. And what we've seen in a lot of these disorders that are characterized by difficulty with self-regulation or cognitive control is this kind of entanglement is the term we've been using of frontal parietal and default mode networks. So these networks that are supposed to be segregated seem to be unsegregated or like entangled um, in people with these various forms of psychopathology. And so I think that this cognitive control training will not only improve their cognitive control on behavioral tasks, but will also lead to better segregation of these networks. Would you overview what each of those networks does and what the entanglement versus disentanglement means? Yeah, for sure. So the frontal parietal network is the attentional network. It's one of the task control networks that is um, responsible for you know, you engage this network when you engage in tasks of cognitive control, right? When you pay attention to external stimuli, when you have to, um, you know, use your working memory or inhibitory control. The default mode network is comprised of various regions, namely the posterior cingulate medial prefrontal cortex that is activated when people are mind wandering or when the brain is at rest. And these networks really work in tandem. When one goes up, the other goes down, vice versa, in a very healthy brain, in a healthy formed brain, an adult brain. Um, our data and others has shown that these networks become more segregated, so they don't activate at the same time with advancing age. Um, but in people with various disorders of self-regulatory control, you don't see that same segregation. You see that they're activated more at the same time. And this might be because in an anxious brain, the brain is never really at rest. People are ruminating, people are, you know, think. And so the default mode is not activating or deactivating as it should be when the frontal parietal network is activated. Is there any additional coupling with salience network, either in terms of, say, default mode is activated and your mind wandering? and you're thinking of fantasies, and then maybe those fantasies activate reward. Or if you start with some reward, some salience signal, then that in turn triggers attention. Mm -hmm. I think that we've seen that before. Um, you know, my work has been focused on that, but I know that I've read about that. Uh, people always think about, you know, there's this tripart tripartite model of cognitive control where the salience is actually the switch, right? Mm -hmm. Between the frontal parietal and the default mode network. Um, so we think about that a lot. We see some stuff in OCD and in anxiety disorders uh, relevant to that model. I like that idea. I, that's the first I've heard the, the switch term, but I've been thinking uh -huh. a lot about the saliency network. And, you know, at, at Dan's, I feel like reward research was pretty overrepresented, which is good for me because, uh -huh. you know, that's what I'm doing. But you remember the poster that I presented? So this was like a gambling game task where mm -hmm. we're looking at reward activation and when you're seeing the gambling game, there's activation on a screen. So you're going to see visual cortex activation and you're pressing a button. So you're going to see motor cortex and you don't want any of that if you're trying to isolate 
reward signal. So there's also a lo losing money condition. And then if you have a win minus loss contrast, then in theory, you're subtracting out all of the activation, like visual and motor and stuff unique to the task so that you can isolate just the reward signal. And that's how I presented those results. Like mm -hmm. here's just the reward signal. And then later I showed it to Randy Buckner, who's in my department, and he's a giant in neuroimaging in our field. And he was saying, no, that's completely the wrong interpretation. Like, look at this. You still see some default mode activation. You still see hints of visual activation. Like, what, what might that mean if the win activation is greater in these regions than loss and it's not completely disappearing? And he was saying, like, this isn't a bad thing. It means that your task worked but it's confounded by saliency network because mm -hmm. it's not like you're paying attention to both the win and loss condition at the same amount. So they don't perfectly cancel out when you do that contrast. So he was saying that we pay more attention to those wins and you're also seeing frontal parietal cortical activation, which I was assuming was just the reward system. But again, he was saying it's confounded by attention as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very true. I fully agree with him. I mean, it's hard to take attention out of that task or any task mm -hmm. for that matter, right? Yeah. See, that's a good example of the, the tangents are actually very encouraged. Yeah, they are. <laughs> yeah, it's good. So is it right then to think of these disorders as just extremes on a whole normal distribution of traits and it's like the cutoff is sort of arbitrary or is it more of a categorical difference, like maybe some genotype or anything, mm -hmm. just more qualitative shift? Right. So that's a great question. Very relevant. Um, so I'm sure, sure you've heard of from NIMH, the research domain criteria, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, I was very lucky when that happened because I had sort of been doing research along those lines for years when that came out. I have a paper that was published in like 2006, frontal striatal disturbances across many different childhood psychiatric illnesses. So the idea that there could be some sort of process or, and, um, you know, a brain corollary that's dysfunctional across many different disorders, right? And it doesn't necessarily have to do with the categorical uh, determination of that disorder, but just the symptom in general. And what I'm very fascinated by is that, you know, there are lots of little kids, for example, that like to have everything just right, right? It's a pretty normal tendency for a kid. They feel safer when their room is set up the way they're used to it. Um, you know, when their stuff is where it normally is, like they like to have that sort of organization. And then there are children who have a little difficulty leaving their house when their room is not directly, you know, organized exactly as they want. And then there are those children who cannot go to school unless their room or everything is lined up just right. So that's, um, you know, obsessive, obsessive symptoms, obsessions, right? They sort of like definitely lie on a continuum. And, um, you know, we recently finished a study, Kate Fitzgerald and I, where we were actually trying to target that. We were recruiting healthy kids, kids who are functionally impaired with OCD and seeking treatment. And we were looking for children who um, fell into our definition of subclinical OC symptoms. And we called it OCS, um, Obsessive Compulsive Symptom Group. Um, and... And we put a lot of thought into it. They weren't yet functionally impaired, so they weren't seeking treatment, but their parents knew that something was up. They were a little more anxious than they should be. And um, most of their anxiety symptoms were based mainly on like ordering and symmetry. Um, that, I mean, I loved this grant. We were so excited to do this, but we got completely flipped by COVID um, where, you know, for a very long time, it was very hard to get healthy kids in and just non-treatment seeking children into the hospital for an MRI scan. Um, so we kind of dropped that aim of the grant. Unfortunately, we weren't able to recruit enough children with subclinical OC symptoms to really look at how their brains differ um, in compared to healthy controls and kids who are functionally impaired with OCD. But that was a tangent. But the example is that, yes, I think symptoms, especially in children, it definitely lie in a continuum, um, mm -hmm. you know, and I think there's something going on either genetically or the environment that tips a child to full-blown illness. Right. So, I mean, my goal in my t entire career, and I will consider possibly retiring if I ever get to do this, is really try to figure out which children have just, you know, symptoms that wax and wane and they're going to be okay. 
and which ones are the one that if we don't intervene early, they're going to develop full-blown functional impairment. I'm imagining for a parent at that subclinical level where you have mild OCD, especially if it's about cleanliness, that could be a good thing. It could be. Um, but as a parent, it also isn't, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Makes it very hard to leave the house. Um, and if you have multiple children, it could be really impairing in the home. Mm -hmm. um, but um, I mean, the other thing that I think is so fascinating is that we have yet to see a child with OCD come into the clinic who doesn't have a parent that either has OCD or is very anxious. Um, so as you know, I've been doing a lot of this dyadic stuff. That's the work that I presented at um, Vans, um, where we've been scanning mothers, scanning children, either their babies or their school-age children. And I really want to get to the point where we're doing something dyadic like that with um, kids with OCD or kids with anxiety, because um, we never know. I mean, and it's entirely possible that, you know, a parent might be anxious because the kid's so functionally impaired. It's also possible that the kid's so functionally impaired because the parent's so anxious. So trying to really tease that apart, I think is important. And I think that leads to some of the discussions we were having at Dan's where in terms of intervention, especially for a young child, that needs to happen at the level of the child, maybe enhancing their cognitive control, but also at the level of the parent, right? Um, you know, the first few sessions of CBT for a kid involves education, where we're really just trying to teach the parent not to accommodate. Mm -hmm. uh, but I think that that's relevant in so many ways. What about really mild OCD, like habits where say you always want the TV volume to be odd or even or at a set number or you want to chew at the same times the same amount of times on your left and right side of your mouth I have little things like that and I imagine a lot a lot of people do maybe it's overrepresented yeah. in academia so I guess two questions there the first, <laughs> is, the first in is for sure <laughs> if that's just lying on a continuum one idea is if it's more trait like then that's just OK, on this whole continuum of traits you could have, you're just like on the mild OCD line and that's fairly stable. And the other idea, this is the more worrying one, is let's say you start off with those mild sort of fixations and then the more you feed into them, maybe they spiral out of control. And it's something like you don't want to give attention even to the thing that seems silly, like the TV volume or the chewing. So wait, I'm sorry. I don't think I found what okay, was so in there. The, yeah. the idea is some people are going to have these mild habits, OCD-like. So those examples that I gave. And one thought is if you're mild, that's just a trait-like thing and you're going to stay there. And whether you're worse than that or less than that is, again, it's kind of just like a trait and it's relatively stable. And the other idea would be Whatever causes you to develop a tick like that in the first place, it can get worse the more you pay attention to it and the more you practice it and say strengthen the brain networks associated mm -hmm. with that, right? So what might start off as just a little thing becomes more obsessive over time. Is there any evidence for that or is it more stable? Um, I think there is. You know, I spent a lot of time um, early in my career studying habit learning, stimulus response learning. And, um, you know, the fascinating thing about that is you know, these uh, striatal structures, the subcortical structures that support habit learning, they're the most primitive structures in the brain. So children have a lot of funky habits, but then when the prefrontal cortex comes online, when they're healthy, they're able to like dampen those habits. They're able to control them and exert top-down control. Um, for adults, I mean, I guess, yeah, I mean, if you continue doing something over and over and over again, it's going to become ingrained. Um, but I mean, I guess if it's not functionally impairing, it's not really a problem, right? Right. OK, I'm going to reveal too much about myself and my own anxious <laughs> behaviors here in giving these examples. But here's another one. And it all, it all has to do with, you know, what's the right type of treatment? Ignore or sort of like satisfy the craving until it's gone. So let's say you're having health anxiety, right? I'll do this where sometimes I get some symptoms and I'm like looking up the symptoms and I sort of neurotically want to just check out all the possibilities and rule out whatever I can rule out. And there, it almost feels like this compulsion 
right? Like yeah. you want to look it up. And then eventually I reach a point where I'm satisfied. I'm like, okay, I think I understand what's going on. It's probably something mild or it's probably in my head. And then it just goes away sort of organically. But if I try and say, I'm not going to do this, I'm not going to search WebMD, I'm just going to ignore it, then I still feel that urge until I, you know, satisfy it. And I'm wondering, is it that I need to get better at ignoring it? Or is it just that I need to get it out of the way as quickly as possible? I mean, I think it could be a little of both. Honestly, I mean, I go through the same thing. Like you have an urge to do something. You feel better if you give into that urge. Mm -hmm. um, you know, like one thing like exposure therapy, what, what they do when they're give, like um, administering exposure therapy is they let you give into an urge, but you have to do something else, right? So rather than walking away from something that's causing you fear, you need to approach it. And eventually mm -hmm. that opposite action actually alleviates the anxiety. So okay. that's sort of the ideal is to find a different way to deal with it. But I mean, with your example, there's really nothing wrong looking up symptoms. I mean, unless you don't, unless, you know, you're getting carried away and you're not sleeping at night, you know, right. but mm -hmm. again, it's all about like all these things. They're not necessarily bad unless they cause functional impairment. They take your time away from other things that you should be doing. They make it so that you cannot leave your house. They make it so that you cannot engage in social situations. You know, if you're not functionally impaired by it, it's okay. Yeah, I like thinking about these things from an evolutionary perspective, especially neuroticism or anxiety or threat sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this idea of, you know, let's say you're walking down the jungle and you see like some shaking in a bush and maybe it's a snake. Maybe it's not. And one approach would be, even if it's a false alarm, if it's just rustling of the wind, you know, dart away from the bush in, just in case it's a snake. And if you're less neurotic and you think it's fine, maybe nine times out of 10, it is fine. But if you get bit and you die, like there might be selection for that increased threat sensitivity, even increased beyond the level of, you know, what your environment is reliably signaling. Mm -hmm. And the other funny and sad thing there is it's like, evolution exact doesn't exactly care what your quality of life is it just cares that you stay alive right right yeah that's interesting so there's this mismatch idea then i mean people talk a lot about this in the context of reward so like you know the reason we have an obesity epidemic here is because we have all of these processed high sugar high fat foods that in our ancestral environments are super tasty because they're super energy dense and they were rare and it's like you're, you're not at risk of getting diabetes or whatever in the wild. And now we are, but millions of years of brain evolution that's shaped us to enjoy these foods, you can't really overcome that. And I hear a lot about it talked in the positive way, like similarly how uh, s smartphone apps can be addicting and they're, they're like mm -hmm. designed, unfortunately, by psychologists to be more addicting. Uh, but then in this negative way of increased anxiety. I'm wondering if there's some sort of mismatch there as well. What increased anxiety? Well, maybe that's an assumption that I shouldn't automatically go into this with. Is it true that anxiety rates, at least in the United States, are at an all-time high? Yes. yes. Why might that be? For sure. I mean, I think the pandemic really did a damper on people. Um, I think in terms of like social anxiety, um, right. I think that's definitely skyrocketed because of the stay at home orders and people got used to being uh -huh. by themselves or just with a select few people in their family. Uh, but even a few years before the pandemic, if I asked you that, the answer still would have been yes, right? Maybe yeah. not as bad, but still worse than ever before. Still worse than ever, for sure. And I think there's much more recognition on it too, hence the overdiagnosis. But, you know, I think mm -hmm. definitely, I mean, I think this is the world where, I mean, I use the example, you know, if you think about our field, academia, how hard is it to get a grant now, right? I mean, like, how hard is it to get promoted in your job now? How hard is it to get into college now, right? So there are reasons why people, you know, have more anxiety than they used to have, like when I was younger. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I'm super interested in how um, anxiety has skyrocketed in youth. Um, since the pandemic. So we're actually trying to study that now, like the emergence of anxiety in the COVID generation.
I think the lack of going to school. I think the lack, yeah, I just submitted a, I mean, I didn't, the preliminary welcome application for that, the welcome trust, the emergence of anxiety in the COVID generation, because we've been scanning babies. Well, we've been studying and following babies that were exposed prenatally to SARS-CoV-2. So we have this really nice cohort. Um, and so we're trying to really understand how, you know, these kids are now preschool age. Um, I don't scan preschoolers because they're way too wiggly. I know some people are trying to do it, but I haven't gone there yet. I probably will eventually. Um, but in this study, we um, propose to use EEG to study cognitive control in these kids because we know that cognitive control deficits are so prevalent in anxiety disorders. And, you know, these poor children and anxiety disorders tend to emerge um, in early school age. Mm -hmm. So when kids are going to school. But if you think about the children who were homeschooled over the pandemic, they didn't go to nursery school. They weren't in daycare. And then all of a sudden they're showing up in a classroom without mommy and daddy around. You know, they, it's it's very different generation. It's going to be a very different generation because mm -hmm. those early years are so um, formative in shaping your socio-emotional development. I've tried thinking about who generationally is going to be most impacted by COVID. So for me, it was during my sophomore and junior year of college. So that was on one hand, the bulk of college, but on the other hand, I had a relatively normal freshman year and relatively mm -hmm. normal senior year, which I think was good for me. I think if it was COVID at the beginning or the end, that might've been a little worse. I think high school would have been definitely worse. Yeah, And what I've gone back and forth about is, okay, I think that it's going to impact children worse than adults, especially if it's some school age. And I wondered, is most of the impact going to be, say, during kindergarten? Because it's one of those things where the early social skills and verbal skills and mathematical skills, they all just compound on each other. So if you fall behind early, you're going to be behind maybe for the rest of your life. Or is it more critical during adolescence when you have, you know, a, a whole new wave of different social changes yeah. happening. I don't, I mean, I don't know. I think it's going to impact both. Mm -hmm. So it's right. hard to say, you know, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to make a get, venture a guess as to which. Uh -huh. I mean, academic achievement, definitely for the younger ones. I mean, I know myself, uh, I did the pandemic March of 2020. I had a kid that was starting middle school. I had a daughter in third grade who still needed to learn her math facts. And I had one in kindergarten who wasn't really even reading yet. So I mean, that was like, but in terms of anxiety, uh -huh. I think the one in the household that the most was me because <laughs> yeah. I was responsible for making sure they were all right. But, uh -huh. um, you know, but yeah, I mean, my daughter is in seventh grade now and she still is struggling in math because she wasn't able to like get her math facts, you know, in third mm -hmm. grade. Right. So it's a, you know. So all of those compound. And then everyone. Yeah. in the study that you mentioned, where you're looking at maternal stress and transmission into kids. So the kids, I mean, they're really infants. So they might have been exposed to the virus and they might have been surrounded by more anxious parents. And all of that, in some sense, is secondhand. Secondhand. Secondhand exposure to stress or anxiety. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So. I mean, they're going to be cool effects there, but they probably weren't as strongly impacted as, say, your children or older children who actually had their normal routines disrupted. Right. Like I'm imagining it, it might have been the best time to be in COVID if you're an infant, because, you know, yeah. your, your behavior is kind of unchanged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's very true. That's an interesting way of thinking about it, for sure. Um. Yeah, I mean, I think the findings that you're referring to, just for the listeners who weren't at my talk at Dan's, uh, you know, we have shown repeatedly that in this um, COVID sample of babies who are exposed prenatally, that it's not their neurodevelopmental outcomes at six months, nine months, 12 months, um, and even now we showed it to 24 months, are not impacted by in utero exposure to SARS-CoV-2 but it is impacted by the degree to which the mother was stressed during mm -hmm. pregnancy and immediately postpartum um, mm -hmm. and also at 24 months. So, um, but I do think you're right. You make a very interesting point 
um, you know, babies are babies, right? They're typically just swaddled and sleeping most of the day. And, you know, they're in their parents' arms or they're in their crib, et cetera, in the stroller. So the, um, you know, the pandemic didn't really impact them as directly as it did school age kids who could no longer go to school, could no longer play with their friends, could no longer, et cetera, right? Um, but what we're targeting is the degree to which the mothers were stressed. The other thing that we're really targeting now is that, you know, we know that the pandemic had a disproportionate impact on um, so socially disadvantaged groups. Um, so we're trying to figure out, you know, how all that determines child outcome. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, structural racism, um, access to food, food insecurity, you know, things like that. We have this sample where most largely because they gave birth in Washington Heights, they're underprivileged. So we're trying to figure that all out now. And we find it so interesting because the women who, you know, are lowest on the economic scale um, really kind of report the least subjective stress during the pandemic. But that doesn't make sense because objectively, you would think they would be even more stressed. Job loss, food insecurity, you know, access to care, but, um, you know, so we're really looking at that in our data right now. And yeah, we I'm had an interesting conversation at Dan's about that yeah. paradox, because it could be that if a baseline level of stress was just much higher, subjectively, they don't notice much of a difference. But maybe if you had some sort of stress biomarker like cortisol, maybe they yeah. have the lowest subjective stress, but the highest cortisol. And that would be a really interesting contrast. Oh, it would be for sure. Oh, it definitely would be. And I think you and I spoke about that. It's too bad that we didn't measure cortisol in those women. I wish we mm -hmm. had. Now I know. But, you know, that's the thing when you run research studies, there's always something you can look yeah. back and be like, oh, I wish I had done that. I wish I had done that. Like so many little mistakes are made and things are missed. But, but you did scan the mother's brains. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Are there any brain differences that you could look at that would be sort of an index of stress levels? So, yes, definitely there are, um, you know, there's the whole idea of like the stress circuitry in the brain. But for now, we've really just been focusing on cognitive control in the moms um, because I'm very interested in how deficits in cognitive control could um, transmit intergenerationally from mother to child, um, because I think that this cognitive control um, dysfunction is so relevant to psychopathology. So it's really trying to index like how psychopathology can be translated or um, transferred intergenerationally. Um, so we, the data that I presented and really all we've looked at thus far is um, looking at um, frontal, parietal and default mode entanglement, that entanglement that I was talking about earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and noticing that the women that had the most stress had the most entanglement in their brains between these networks and their children had the poorest outcomes at 24 months in terms of the CBCL and the BITSI, which is the brief toddler assessment. So I'm in thinking of confidence of it, and what? I'm thinking of at least three ways that you could see this intergenerational transmission. It's probably some combination of all of them, but I'm wondering which you're most interested in. So one would be epigenetic type effects from the mother's perspective. So this would only apply to mothers who are pregnant during the stress period. And maybe those stress levels can trigger epigenetic changes that actually change the infant's genome. And then that could be linked to those later differences in brain development and regulatory control. Another difference could be epigenetic, but from the infant's perspective. So maybe something like the mother has higher stress and has higher cortisol levels in her blood and in her breast milk, and then the infant feeding on that milk or even just like smelling her pheromones, those could trigger some changes. And then the other would be something like social learning. So maybe the mother who's more stressed isn't talking to her baby as much or in as healthy a way, and that could impact the infant's learning and brain development in some more environmental way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think all three. I mean, I'm not an epigeneticist at all, um, so I'm not personally studying that, but I think all three ideas are very plausible. Uh -huh. sure. So then I, I imagine the third is closest to what you can measure. So yeah. what, do you have are, any specific measures there? Yeah, so I work with um, 
uh, Danny Dimitru, um, who is a pediatrician and basic neuroscientist, and she's the one that really spearheaded and started this whole COVID mother baby outcome initiative at Columbia. That's the cohort that I'm working with. And um, she is very interested and studies um, something called early relational health. So um, as a pediatrician, so from zero to three. So like mother-infant bonding, for example, is so integral for social emotional development. So we have these fun like um, remote assessments of mother-infant relationship um, that we were doing in the combo cohort. Um, and we haven't coded all these videos yet, but I'm really interested in linking that to the brain data. Mm -hmm. And when you say coding the videos, you mean like different types of behaviors, like how often they're touching the baby or looking yeah. at their eyes or something like that. Exactly. Mm -hmm. In free play, um, we have a version of like the strange situation that we did remotely, things like that. Mm -hmm. So trying to really understand. I mean, and I think, you know, we're really still trying to figure out the effects of in utero exposure to SARS-CoV-2. Now, although we're not seeing it immediately when the baby's born, we're not seeing it up to two years. You know, we know that um, babies born to HIV positive moms, they're not born with HIV, but they're cognitive sequelae that happen later on. So we're really trying to look at this sample in light of that. like, although the prenatal exposure doesn't affect them right now, we don't know if it's going to affect them later. And one of the moderators for that trajectory could be early relational health, right? Mm -hmm. So somebody who's exposed in utero might have some sort of predetermined trajectory for something. But if they had really good bonding, relational health with their parents when they were younger, maybe they have like this resilient phenotype. Mm -hmm. So we think about, you know, this is the type of stuff we're thinking about. When you have a really long, long study, like the Minnesota twin one, which has been going on 40 plus years, are those usually studies that start off something like yours and then Maybe the grant is for two or three years and then you reapply and you just keep reapplying. And if you're lucky, you get to extend it across the lifespan. That's the goal. Yeah, that is definitely the goal. We just put in an R01 um, to continue studying these kids at preschool. Um, we don't, unfortunately, we didn't put imaging in there because like I said, you know, we don't really want to go and scan toddlers. <clears throat> but Kate Fitzgerald, the child psychiatrist who I work with most closely, she also has an electrophysiology lab. So we're planning on studying cognitive control in these kids um, when they are three to four years. And then again, when they're five to six years. And, you know, my plan is to write a supplement if we get awarded that grant to stick imaging on, um, MRI on when they get a little older. So yeah, the idea is that we're just going to be grant machines and continue uh -huh. applying for funding to continue following this cohort because it's a very unique cohort. Um, yeah. and it would be really a shame not to continue following it, but and yeah, how large is the it? Minnesota twin study, it's like Myrna Weissman's, you know, generations of depression. Um, I'm, I'm sure you probably know about those data where, you know, she's been studying children of parents, of grandparents, of great grandparents who were depressed and trying to look at, because we know that like maternal depression is such a risk, high risk marker for, um, anxiety and depression. So trying uh -huh. to see how far that goes down generationally. I mean, I think that that work is fascinating. I haven't heard of those studies. And I wonder if it's more genetic or if it's more just whatever the shared environment is that places them at risk. I mean, nature and nurture, it's obviously both. Yeah, it's always right? going to but... be a question that we're going to be asking, you know, 50 years from now still. So it's hard to tell. Yeah, there's cool rodent research related to that and related to the maternal stress we're talking about. And I don't remember how many generations it went down, but there's all these epigenetic changes where if you induce stress in a mother rodent, then part of it is cortisol and hormones based. So like her milk will actually be different to the infant, but also her behavior will change. So, mm -hmm. you know, there's like all of the nursing behavior and like licking the pups and doing all the, these things that boost oxytocin levels and reduce anxiety. And they do less of that. So then yeah. the pups receive less of that and they grow up more anxious. And then when they mother, they're more anxious. So they don't mother their kids as well. And like that whole thing just keeps going intergenerationally, which is yeah. really fascinating and sad. Yeah, it really is. And I think, you know, it would be so nice to see how translatable that model is to the human, right? Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, those are hard studies to design with humans. Um, but yeah, so I'm currently, I'm about to start working with a really um, amazing basic neuroscientist um, who is studying that in rodents, actually. 
and try to figure out if there's a way to mimic those types of experiments in humans. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it would, be, it would be confounded by so many other things. Plus, there's like the added level of subjectivity where it's one of those things where your brain is constantly rationalizing your behavior, right? So if you're more stressed out and you're in very subtle ways not being as attentive a parent, you're probably not going to realize it. You're probably right. just going to rationalize your stress and the thing that you're focused on instead of, you know, cuddling your baby for an extra 10 minutes. Right, right. I mean, it's true, you know, and it's so funny because, you know, they say research is me search. But yeah, I mean, uh -huh. I think about this stuff all the time. I've got three kids. When I'm in the middle of writing a grant, but they want to show me something they made, I'm like, okay, hold on, hold on. You know, what is more important, right? And you're constantly juggling these things, like, especially as a working mother, right? Um, but yeah, I mean, you need to spend it, you need to pay attention to your children. There's no question, but you also need to get your work done, right? So yeah, that causes stress. And then that likely has a poor impact on your children. So it's mm -hmm. like, what are you going to do? How large is this sample of mother infant dyads? We have 1500. 1500. Wow. Yeah. So not only is that large enough that you could potentially follow them throughout the lifespan and even attrition, like if people drop out over time, you have enough that you don't really mm -hmm. have to worry about that too much. But it's also large enough that even relatively rare disorders, like what we were talking about earlier, like OCD, there's probably going to be, what, like a dozen out of the 1500 that develop something like that? There might be, and we'll probably catch them. Yeah. I mean, you know, unfortunately, research is so expensive. So mm -hmm. the first grant that we got, we were only funded to scan 100 babies. 100, like half would be, you know, exposed prenatally to SARS and half not. Um, we then got additional funding to scan another hundred of the women, the mothers, to really look at, you know, the goal of that grant was to really tease apart um, structural determinants of health and COVID infection on maternal mental health. But that's data that I presented at DAMS. Um, you know, uh, the grant that we just submitted, um, we are asking for funding to do um, a clinical evaluation on 475 of the toddlers that were born during the pandemic and enrolled in the study. But, mm -hmm. it, you know, it's hard to find the money to study all of them. It's like it's very piecemeal, right, how uh -huh. we're getting this funding, because it's not a study that was designed by a work group, you know, from the institutes. Right. Um, the funding institutes. It was a study that we designed <laughs> on the front lines <laughs> at the height of the pandemic. So it's very hard to get all the money that you need to really follow all of these kids. It's amazing to me that ABCD did work out that way. So this is an ongoing study with 11,000 kids starting at age nine, and they're going to follow them for 10 years, and they scan every other year. So that's 50,000 brain scans. Mm -hmm. $500 an hour. They're probably doing several hours. So that's like $50 million just on oh, the see, scanning yeah. alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And ABCD is wonderful. I mean, I think so much has come already from that data set, you know, but then you get into the whole thing about, you know, effect sizes and, you know, the, is it really so great to have such a large data set? You're, uh, you know, the effect sizes are inflated, like, you know, all that stuff that people talk inflated about. Inflated how? I don't think I've heard of these downsides. The downside. Well, I mean, you're likely going to find a significant effect the larger uh -huh. your sample is, right? right? What does that mean, right? It might be even more meaningful, meaningful to find a significant effect in a better characterized, smaller right. sample. I see. You know, so a so smaller effect can be about. significant, but it could just be significant noise. Although the right. nice thing about when you have a sample that's so massive is you can split it however you want. So maybe like uh -huh. 7,000 to train your model and then another 3,000 for validation. And if you find the effect in both, that gives you kind of double the confidence. Yeah, for sure. And I think that's where, you know, the beauty of those studies come out. I have an MD PhD student right now, Tracy Shi, who is doing just that actually, applying different machine learning models to ABCD data to pull out signatures of obsessive compulsive symptoms that she can then see if those signatures predict treatment response in my clinically ascertained data. Um, so that's her MD, PhD, NRSA. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's one of the most amazing things about these large publicly available data sets is that you can use them as sort of like the test and the, or, you know, the training and the test, or you could use it as the training and then test it in more clinical mm -hmm. samples. You know, one of the things that people um, 
thing is a pitfall of ABCD, but I mean, there really was no other way for them to do it is they're using this computerized case ads, right? And the case ads really should. The case ads is the kitty. It's the um, schedule for affective disorders in children. Um, And it typically, it was designed to be administered by a clinician, right? Because there are questions that then, you know, spark a follow-up question which is getting into a different category of illness, right? But mm-hmm. they have the parents in ABCD doing the case ads, a computerized version. So, you know, yes, it's been validated. I think it's definitely the best they could have done because there's no way they could have a clini- clinician interview all these kids, right? Repeatedly. Right. Um, but it's not as sensitive. Mm-hmm. Do you notice any differences in research methods or perspectives doing this clinical work, but like you mentioned, coming from more of an experimental background than a clinical background? I mean, I suppose, I mean, one of the things that's been great for me in my career is, I guess, because I'm not a clinician. Well, I guess clinicians could do this too. I've never been married to one disorder, right? So I've mm-hmm. been able to easily float across many different disorders and using, you know, this construct of self-regulation or the brain that support the brain systems that support self-regulatory processes as the common thread across all my work. Um, so, I mean, that's a different perspective for sure. Um, as far as I, I, I guess, you know, my perspective is more based on cognitive neuroscience um, and imaging than in clinical phenomenology. But, um, you know, that's why, you know, I really love these multi PI plans, um, that people do with grants because, um, you know, I really am such a firm believer in interdisciplinary science. Um, I think the work that I do requires people like me and clinicians who are very familiar with people who have this, a specific disorder and the Mm -hmm. treatment of it. Right. So, yeah, I mean, most of my work, we definitely capitalize on this multi-PI plan. And the overlap with the animal theory that we talked about. Mm-hmm. And, yeah. All, yeah. And the larger scale. It's very development. hard to get a translational grant funded because uh-huh. what happens is, you know, the way that study section runs. Right. Well, you know, in the U.S. especially NIH study section, you know, it's very if you have a basic and a clinical portion of a grant right? The clinicians don't really understand the basic part and the basic scientists don't really understand the clinical part. So it's very hard to get scored high on those. Um, I would have thought it was the opposite because then everyone has a piece that they could score high, but I I see what it really depends on the luck of the reviewers, right? Who are your three reviewers? Um, But, you know, I think that those types of grants really should be going to more like special emphasis panels. Mm -hmm. So... Is there anything else you want to talk about, Rachel, ongoing or future research plans or any past work that you want to highlight? Not really. I mean, I think I, you know, I already told you what my ultimate goal is, is to really identify targets in a child's brain for prevention, Mm -hmm. um, things that we could intervene with um, non-invasively, you know, like this cognitive control training. Um, I like those things that are very tractable. I think that, um, my role as a mother has definitely informed um, what I'm interested in studying, um, you know, watching children grow in my own house and seeing, you know, how things can go awry or not. Um, I, let's see, what else? I've gotten very interested, like, you know, we spoke about in this idea of maternal stress. And that really only came about because I had a postdoc who was interested in stress. Um, but we saw such interesting effects of stress on both the mother brain and the child brain and child outcomes. So we're really following that further. Um, what else? What else? The other thing that I'm super interested in, um, but I haven't really gotten um, going with yet. I happen to be a very ma- a major yogi. I do yoga every day. Yoga meditation. Uh-huh. I think it's like the most amazing thing that somebody can do for themselves. Um, I think it would be an amazing adjunctive um, treatment for anxiety in youth. Um, Mm -hmm. And I know that people have been exploring it, but there are a lot of um, neighborhoods, especially the neighborhood where my hospital is, where, you know, the kids are rather underprivileged and don't have access to that in their schools. 
Um, so what I really want to do is try to find funding to look at the effects of yoga or meditation on anxiety, like, either, you know, with CBT, um, you know, so sort of like a randomized clinical trial where you take kids who are good and going to get CBT, you scan their brains before and after, and half of them also get some yoga meditation program. Um, you know, if we think about that whole entanglement across the frontal parietal default mode networks, we know from studies of, um, you know, meditators or monks that default mode connectivity within network connectivity is greater in people who meditate, right? Because they're better able to relax and let their mind wander, less rumination, right? So if you mm. think about instilling that in a child at a very young age, it could be a really nice preventative measure. I'm wondering if there, again, the evolutionary theory might be one explanation for why it works. Like if, if you're sitting down and relaxing and doing nothing but focused on your breathing, well, you must not be in a threatening environment. Otherwise, yeah. you couldn't have the safety to do that. And then maybe yeah. as a side effect, that's what lowers anxiety. There's like this subconscious recognition of I must be safe enough to do this. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, I fully agree. I mean, and then, so, um, oh, and just the other thing that I'm super interested in that I haven't started studying yet, although we did a little, we have a, we developed this uh, media use screen, uh, David Pagliaccio and I, um, that we administered to many, many children who came into the lab. And um, one of my research assistants actually just submitted an abstract for a poster at um, biological psychiatry, the next biological psychiatry meeting, I think in May, um, where we're looking at um, problematic gaming, like video game mm -hmm. use or screen use. Oh, I had that in my teens. Oh, so many kids do, like so many kids do. Um, and how that affects brain development. Um, you know, I know people are doing that in many different ways. Um, what's interesting is that when we designed this screen use that we're using in my lab, that was when my kids, it's particularly my son, was addicted to like playing these games. And I was just like sort of fascinated by what may have been going on in his brain being intermittently rewarded on various trials of these games. Now. It's TikTok, right? Mm -hmm. So the stimulus is changing every 60 seconds. So every 60 seconds, these kids are getting like a dopaminergic surge in their brain. So we're yeah. literally like creating little drug addicts. Um, so I'm very fascinated by that. Like I, I, I feel like I need to do something with that. Um, I was involved in a, a small-ish organization called Children and Screens out of Stony mm -hmm. Brook. And I actually almost gave up my Columbia professorship to run that. Because I was so interested in this because research is me search, right? And I'm worried about my kids. But um, yeah, that's another area that I want. We get talked into. about this at the conference a little bit. And I remember asking you, okay, given all this research, and you mentioned that your children use their iPads and, you know, that's something welcome in the house. Why not try and prevent that? And you gave an interesting answer. I don't remember what you said, but I think it was something having to do with like, if you block it, they're just going to want it more. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's the same. With any of these um, aspects of self-regulation, if the child doesn't learn to regulate themselves, they're never going to regulate themselves as adults, right? So if you regulate it for them, they're then just going to want it more. Um, it's just like, you know, if when I was a kid, I was never allowed to have junk cereal. I was never allowed to have any crap in the house to eat. So what did I do? I went to my friend's house and I ate an entire bin of fluff. And I was nauseous for two days, right? So when you, when you completely say no, then the child is going to try to go out and get it more. So there's like a fine line, right? I mean, of course, you need like structure in the home and you need rules, um, but you can't take it away entirely, especially screen use in this day and age because all these kids have their screens. Right. So, Yeah. I'm still trying to figure out how to be the best parent I can be. I mean, I think that's even harder than my academic job, but um, it's definitely insightful knowing what I know about the brain and brain development um, when looking at my own kids. Yeah, I, I love the research is me search interplay. I see that a lot in myself mm -hmm. and the way I think about future plans as well. Yeah. Yeah. This has been great, Rachel. I look oh, forward to you. seeing what comes out of this research and maybe we can do a follow-up at some point once you have some new results to share. 
Oh, I'm happy to. This is lovely. I love that you do this. I think this was a very fun conversation. Thank you. Thank you.